prayers of the court martial read out to them. And through a half-open door in one room of the hut, I saw Pastor Bonhoeffer, before taking off his prison guard, kneeling on the floor, praying fervently to his God. I was most deeply moved by the way that this lovable man prayed. So devout, so certain that God heard his prayer. At the place of execution, he again said a short prayer and then climbed the steps to the gallows, brave and composed. His death took only a few seconds. In the almost 50 years that I've worked as a doctor, I have hardly ever seen a man die so entirely submissive to the will of God. His last words, for me, this is not the end, but simply the beginning. As we reflect on those words, and as I thought about it this week, and last week, because, you know, I, have this, I wrote this sermon last week. But it, as I reflected on those and I thought about those words, I, it made me a little bit introspective. Upon my death, would somebody be able to witness that peace? What allows Bonhoeffer, who we think may have been innocent, even though he was part of this conversation, what allows Bonhoeffer to walk to his death at the age of 46 years old, with such peace. It doesn't make much sense, does it? At a moment of turmoil and a, a moment of loss, knowing that his life on this side of glory is about to end, why can a doctor who's witnessing this from the outside see the fruit of the Spirit because that's what it is, right? Even in death, we have a man who walks to the gallows with confidence. Why? Because, quite frankly, he has something that only Christ can offer. He has deep within his soul an abounding peace, a peace that surpasses all understanding as he goes to his death. For me, this is simply the beginning with such confidence, right? And this is the power of peace in his life and an ability to show the fruit of the Spirit ab abounding in him, even in death. What allows us to do that? Peace is this very fickle thing in our lives and our culture. In the culture that we're in, peace is very much affected by all of the things that are happening around us. So we tend to think that Peace requires quietness and stillness. We, we tend to think that peace requires that everything is calm, right? There is, there's not much happening around us. I used to think that that's what peace was. And then I had a lot of kids, and I don't think that's what peace is anymore. You see, I used to have this very quiet and, and very ordered and clean house. I used to have Maybe someday I'll have it again. I doubt it. And in our minds, in the way that we think about peace in our culture, we seem to think that that's what it is. It's the absence of conflict. It's the absence of noise, right? It's, it's stillness. It's calmness. It's quiet. But peace is actually a state of the soul. Peace is, is actually the state of the heart, the mind. That's what it really is. We confuse it with all of these other things. We, we think it means that conflict is not present, but we can have peace in the midst of conflict. Bonhoeffer clearly shows peace in the face of trial and even death, right? So what is it for us to say that we are people of peace? And quite frankly, how is it that we live as people of peace? Paul instructs the church in Colossians to let the peace of Christ rule your hearts. And, and 
I think that begs the question from each and every one of us is, what rules our hearts? Now, if we want to take a step back and think about our lives and the culture that we live in, we, we don't really like the idea that anything else can rule any part of me. Right. We like to have control over our own lives. We, we like to think that we have control over everything that's happening. And so what rules our own hearts, if we're being honest and true, we would probably say me. Not me as like, I rule your heart, but me as in, I rule my own. To rule means to reign. To rule means to have authority over, to reign over, to have power over. And we don't like the idea that something or someone else would have any kind of power over us. I control my destiny. I control the outcomes of my life. My life. And when the outcomes don't go the way that I want it, then it's somebody else's fault. Right? We like this idea that we have control over all things, and yet Paul calls Christians in Colossae to say, let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts. Because the fact of the matter is, no matter how much control we think we might have over our lives, something rules our hearts. Something. And quite frankly, I think the devil knows this. Our hearts are so easily distracted by the things of this world. Jesus tells us that where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Because Jesus understands the power and the pool that things can have on our hearts. Like money and power and success. Those are just sort of the big ticket items. But it could be the desire to be loved. It could be the desire to control. It could be selfishness. It could be ambition. All of these things are in a battle. And they're in a battle for our hearts. Because if you control the heart, then you control how a person lives and interacts in the world. I think we have to wrestle with, as Christians in this culture today, what has battled for our hearts? I think Jesus, and I, I know Jesus, as we read scriptures and we read the Gospels, Jesus is very clear in what he expects from his followers. Pick up your cross and follow me. But Jesus wants the whole thing. And we seem to think that we can kind of split it up. I'll give part of my heart over here, and I'll give part of my heart over there, and I'll, you know, I'll, I'll kind of just compartmentalize everything. But that is not what Jesus calls us to as the church. Jesus wants the whole thing. He wants our total and utter devotion. And it's only when we give that to him can we truly begin to understand the peace that he offers. Paul says, let the peace of God rule in your hearts. Which should make us all ask ourselves this question, is it? Is God's peace reigning over me? Is God's peace ruling my heart? Is the peace of Christ that can only be offered us to the, by the cross of Christ reigning over me? Often we fall short of that mark. And it's because we think that peace is something that we can't control. So there's this misconception about peace. It leads us to uh, two, actually, misconceptions. One is that we think that peace is something that's passive, something that happens to us, not something that we're actively participating in. So we've all said it, right, that we get to these moments of when, when the storms are raging around us or we're going through a period of loss or grief or, or whatever it might be, and we go, well, I feel at peace about this. So we, it's this feeling, but here's the problem with feelings that leads us to the next misconception, is that feelings are often things we cannot control. So if peace is just this feeling, if it's just this emotion that we have in response to the things that are happening around us, then it isn't something we can control. Control, but it also then can be something that rules our hearts. P 
peace is, is not necessarily the absence of conflict, especially for the Christian. Peace is not the promise that the waters will be calm. Peace is the promise that we can be calm in the storm. I've said this before. I, I truly and honestly believe that Jesus can calm the storm that is raging within us without calming the storm that is raging around us. but only when we begin to grasp the greatness and glory of the peace that Christ offers to us. Only when we begin to grasp what Christ has done on the cross and rising from the grave. We sang two songs this morning about the power of the cross and lift high the cross. This moment of struggle and turmoil and death actually is the thing that surrounds us and covers us with peace. That if we truly believe that Jesus conquers death, and we truly believe that Jesus has claimed us as his own, and we've clothed ourselves with Christ and taken on the image of God, then we can't help but think that nothing in this world can overcome the peace that he offers us. But here's the leap. Because we can't just sit back and wait for peace to come, which is what I think we do sometimes. We just kind of wait for it to happen based on the circumstances around us. And quite frankly, it's never going to happen that way. And if that's our approach to life, then something else is going to take a hold of our hearts. We have to actively pursue Jesus. We have to actively pursue our relationship with him. I want to turn us to uh, Paul in Philippians. I'm going to put it up on the screen here because Paul, Paul also wrote the letter to the Colossians. He reads, writes this letter to the uh, Philippians. You've got to think that Paul's got peace on the mind, peace on the heart, right? Because we want to know how can we live as people of peace? How can this peace rule our hearts when the world around us seems so dark and with so much turmoil and so much struggle? How can we say that the peace of Christ can rule over us? Well, Paul writes this to the Philippians. Do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation by prayer and petition. Anxiousness, anxiousness has the ability to rule our hearts, by the way. And many of us have experienced that in one way or another, haven't we? And Paul instructs the church, do not be anxious. Well, that's easier said than done, isn't it, right? But why? How? What are the things? Why can't we be anxious? But in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your request to God. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. So Paul actually lays out three things for us. Three things that will allow the peace of God to rule our hearts. The first is prayer and petition. If we're willing to go before God and lay our hearts down before Him, do not be anxious about anything but in prayer and petition. So we pray. The second thing is with thanksgiving. He says that both in Philippians and in Colossians, with thanksgiving. But here's the thing about thanksgiving. When we take a step back and we begin to be thankful for what God has done in our lives, and we get a grander picture of all that's happening around us, all of the moments and all of the times that God has brought us through the storm, all of the times that we've been able to trust in Him and His unfailing love. You can't help but step back in that moment and go, okay, I think I'm going to be all right. It's with thankfulness for the mercy and grace of God, thankfulness for the cross of Christ, our salvation and our redemption, that we give peace begins to roll over us. Because we know that in life and in death we belong to Jesus. And the third thing, which comes to us in Colossians, is to dwell in the Word. Let the Word of Christ dwell in you richly. If we want the peace of God to rule our hearts, these three things, prayer, Thanksgiving and the Word are the way in which God will move in us and take our anxiousness away. 
when we look at Bonhoeffer and his life and death, what does the man see? The doctor sees a man in prayer. We see a man who is thankful for God's unending mercy and grace. And a man whose the word has formed and who dwells in it. If we want the peace of Christ to rule our hearts, we have to pray, to be thankful, and to dwell in the Word. And when we do these things, when we trust in this Jesus who has claimed us and marked us as His own, who has called us His children and the children of God, when the peace of Christ comes over us, we can look around at the world, and no matter where we find ourselves, and no matter what the struggle is, no matter what our deep, dark questions might be, we know that we are claimed by the God who holds all things in his hands. And the God who conquers death and gives us life abundantly. A peace that transcends, a peace that surpasses all understanding. The state of Bonhoeffer's soul in his death is nonsense to the world makes no sense. But when we pray, and when we're thankful, and when we dwell in the Word, and we're not talking, you know, you got to give me an hour a day. This, this is something that could take five minutes to pray, to be thankful, to dwell in the Word every day. You would be amazed at the peace that will come over your soul. It's a peace that only Christ can offer to us. It's a peace that surpasses all understanding. This morning we're going to finish with one of my favorite hymns, It Is Well. If you've never heard the song or you don't know, so many of the hymns of the church have just wonderful stories that were very painful for the people who went through them. They make for a great sermon illustration. It is well, the song was written in 1871 by a man named Horatio Spafford. Spafford was a wealthy businessman in Chicago, a real estate developer. He had five children, and he was a deep, he had a deep faith. In 1870, Spafford's only son, his youngest child, four years old, died from scarlet fever. In the midst of his grief, just a few months later, the great Chicago fire wiped out all that he owned. Every property that he owned was burned to the ground, lost everything. The stress that all of this had put on his family, he decided that they needed to get out of town. And his friend, the great evangelist D.L. Moody, some of you may have heard of him, was in England doing a uh, revival, uh, tent revival, go traveling around England sharing the gospel. And so Moody invited the Spafford family to come and join him on the crusade. And, and Spafford thought this would be a good break from all the stress that they were under. But the day that they were supposed to leave, Spafford had a business opportunity to get his family back on track financially. And so his wife said that she would stay, and he said, no, go ahead, and I will catch up with you just a few days behind. Two days later, Spafford opened the paper on his front door to the news that the boat his family was on had sunk in the Atlantic Ocean. Not knowing what had happened to his family, he waited and waited for news to hear if his family had survived. Two days later, he got a telegram from England, so it's wife, and it read, survived alone. I don't know what to do. Spafford's remaining four children died on the boat. Childless and penniless, there was nothing else left for him to do than to get on the boat and go be with his wife in England, so that's what he did. Stricken with grief 
and lost. He gets called up to the deck of the boat by the captain of the ship. The captain points down into the waters. Here is where that boat lies. With your daughters resting in peace. When Spafford penned these words on the deck of that ship, it is well. From the depth of his pain and his grief, in the midst of the greatest trial of his life, he writes, when peace like a river attendeth my way, in sorrow like sea billows roar, whatever my lot thou hast taught me to say, it is well. As well with my soul. Though Satan should buffet, though trials shall come, let this blessed assurance control that Christ has regarded my helpless estate. He has shed his own blood for my soul. My sin. Oh, the bliss of this glorious thought. My sin, not in part, but the whole nailed to the cross and I bear it no more praise the Lord praise the Lord on my soul it is well only a man who belongs to Christ can make that proclamation Only a person who lets the peace of Christ rule their hearts can stare that down with such assurance and confidence. Friends, let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts. May you dwell in the word richly. May you pray and give thanks and dwell in the word. That whatever we face on this side of glory is nothing compared to the greatness and glory of our home above. It is well. It is well with my soul. Let the peace of God rule in you. A peace that surpasses all understanding. Whatever you do and work and need, let, let you do it for the glory of God and God alone. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, amen. Let us now stand and affirm what we believe. Stay in the process of